Most of us call South Florida home, but how much do you know about the real natives of this land? You know, the animals. They're our neighbors, and it turns out the more we know about them, the better off we all are. So join us as we explore the habits and habitats of some of the amazing creatures that live among us. The folks at Bush Wildlife Sanctuary in Jupiter are helping us in this endeavor. Bush Wildlife Sanctuary is a wildlife hospital and educational facility. So the first part of our mission is to take in sick, injured, and orphaned wild animals and get them better and release them back out into the wild again. What we notice doing this is that about 90% of the patients that come into us have been affected by humans. So we see lots of animals who've been hit by cars, caught in fishing line, electrocuted, kept as pets, attacked by people's pets, all sorts of human-related impact takes place on these animals. And that's really where our second mission came in. That is education. We really want for people to understand how to coexist with these animals and hopefully to help them as well. Animals like Warrior here, who is an American kestrel, were hit by a car, most likely because someone threw litter out of their car window, attracting them to the roadways. If we're able to teach people about that and give Warrior a second chance at life as an educational ambassador, hopefully we won't see these things happen again. Now it's time to meet some of the residents and learn some valuable lessons they have to share. So today we are in our deer yard and you might notice there's a couple other animals other than our deer. This is Daffodil. She is our female white-tailed deer and you can tell she's a girl because as you see, she doesn't have any antlers. Uh, if one of our boys happens to come over, I'll be able to show you theirs as well. You can also see we've got our turkey who are here. Oh, Sandhill Crane going by. <laughs> uh, the turkeys are here in our deer enclosure because actually in the wild they would share the same environment. These guys definitely like more of a dry environment, so they like a pine flatwood even. And uh, the male turkeys and the female turkeys obviously look different. Hello, Daffodil, are you coming back again? Here we have one of our female turkeys. You notice, oh, she's showing off, <laughs> strutting, so you call it. So our female turkeys, they don't have that long waddle that you notice. They have a much shorter beard compared to one of our big guys over here. The male turkeys, who is also showing off, they've got that nice waddle. They will fluff out their feathers and they will strut their stuff to show kind of who's in charge. Daffodil is showing you her beautiful white tail there. Uh, they have only white fur underneath their tail. So if for any reason they start to feel like they're in danger, that is a warning sign for them. This is Nobs. He has very tiny little antlers here. I'm not quite sure if y'all can see them well, but that is because he was neutered at a young age. And so therefore his antlers are not gonna grow in fully because he doesn't have the same hormones. Over here is Cypress. Cypress has this beautiful rack of antlers. And you'll notice though, they're kind of different than you might expect. Deer in the wild will shed their antlers every single year. And each year they'll grow them in and they'll get larger. Cypress was also neutered, but a little bit later in life. So his antlers are always gonna stay the same size, but they stay in this beautiful texture, which is called velvet. And this velvet texture comes in every year as the new antlers grow in. As time goes by, that velvet sheds off and then they'll actually shed their own antlers. The material is very similar to what your fingernails are made out of. So it doesn't hurt them at all when their antlers shed. It's just similar to if you were to break a nail. Two of our friends here, Nubs and Daffodil, came into our sanctuary for very different reasons. Nubs is about a year older than Daff and it was really a well-meaning individual. Um, a lady had found Nubs out in the wild alone. Chances are, mom was probably just out looking for food to come back and take care of him, but she didn't realize that, thought he was an orphan, and brought him into her home. She tried her very best to raise him, and she did a good job as far as he stayed alive, she got him going, but unfortunately, he wasn't raised with other deer. He also wasn't raised in a proper enclosure where he had enough sunlight. 
So by the time he came into the sanctuary, he was very used to people and unfortunately had very poor skin condition, poor coat condition. So we worked on getting him onto a proper diet and in with other deer to actually get him to the point where he is now. But as you can see, he kind of acts more like a puppy dog. <laughs> so to release him into the wild wouldn't work because of his personality and how used to people he is. Daffodil, our little doe that we have, is a bit of a different story and, and kind of an unusual one. Daffodil was a little fawn um, who I truly believe was orphaned. It's very rare for wildlife to orphan their children unless they feel something's wrong with them. So when Daffodil came in, she was very tiny and she had lots of, of stomach issues. She always seemed to have an upset tummy. So over time, we realized that she's kind of stunted and uh, those tummy issues have followed her through life. So she may have been an animal that truly in nature would not survive well. So that made her a good candidate for staying here as an educational ambassador. White-tailed deer are herbivores. They're plant eaters. They eat very little, if any, uh, meat material. It's gonna be lots of weeds and grasses and trees and things of that nature. Uh, when they sleep, they actually do sleep laying down. Uh, they're rather light sleepers. They always have to be on their game because other animals do prey upon them or would eat them. So things like panthers would be a predator of the deer. So while they sleep laying down, they're always pretty cognizant of their surroundings. So in captivity, you can take any animal's lifespan and double to triple it. So in captivity, we're looking at possibly into their mid-teens, even maybe up to 20 years old. In the wild though, it's gonna be cut much shorter. Um, you're looking at you know five, seven, maybe 10 years of age is all you're gonna get out there because there are so many factors. If they do get injured, they can't just take themselves to the doctor. They also have to compete for food, younger animals that are also competing for the same resources, and human-related issues such as being hit by a car or hunting. So these deer in the wild would actually hang out in a herd. So a group of them would stay together in an area that's nice and lush and green with plenty of resources for them to find food and water and shelter, just somewhere to hide and somewhere to camouflage. In captivity, we also try to keep a group of them together as they do seem to appreciate that family dynamic. So you might notice behind me a bald eagle. Of course, the bald eagle is our national symbol. It's the national bird of America. Bald eagles are really quite interesting birds. They get the name bald, but they aren't bald at all. If you notice, they've got white feathers on their head and on their tail feathers. And that is what the old English term for white was bald. So that's where the name bald eagle comes from. Bald eagles are actually quite plentiful here in Florida. In fact, Florida, at this point in time, has the second largest population of eagles. The only state that has more than us is Alaska. If you think about it, it kind of makes sense because bald eagles' favorite food is fish. Florida is surrounded by water and so is Alaska. Lots of fish for them. The bald eagles here, though, are much, much smaller than Alaskan eagles. And that's for good reason. Think about how cold it gets up there. The fishing becomes more difficult. The eagles have to be larger to be able to sustain long periods of time where they might not be able to catch anything. Here in Florida, they don't need to store as much reserves, so our eagles tend to be considerably smaller than what you're gonna find up north. One state that was trying to take over our number two rating, and that's Montana. They have quite a few eagles there as well, but to my knowledge, they haven't quite proven yet that they can overtake Florida in the ranking system. Eagles, the number one injury we see is being hit by cars. The reason for that, unfortunately, is they like to scavenge. They like to go out and look for carrion, which is dead animal matter. That is something they can eat without really any work put into it. So the eagles are commonly seen hanging out with vultures, which of course is another scavenger of the animal world. The way they became the national symbol for us though, quite an interesting story. So back in the days when we were still at war, a couple centuries ago, Benjamin Franklin, I know you guys have heard of him, was actually tasked with going out and figuring out our national bird. He did not feel the bald eagle was a good choice. Why is that? Because eagles, like I said, they're scavengers. They like to eat dead stuff, but they're also thieves. If they see a smaller animal with something they want, they'll chase them away and they will steal it from them. Mr. Franklin, he didn't think that was a very good representation of what America should be seen as. So he recommended 
the wild turkey. Make Thanksgiving pretty awkward if we were eating our national symbol. <laughs> he was outvoted because turkeys really aren't very intimidating. The bald eagle won out with our forefathers and it's been that way ever since. So we're here in Bush Wildlife Sanctuary's Wildlife Hospital. And this is really the main mission of the sanctuary is we take in sick, injured, and orphaned wild animals that are native to the state of Florida with the goal of returning them back out into the wild again when they're healthy. We average about 5,000 animals a year that are brought to us. And most of those animals come in because of human-related injury or illness. We'll get animals in that have been shot illegally, animals that have been kept illegally as pets, attacked by people's pets, fishing line entanglement, electrocution, being hit by cars, all sorts of different things. And sometimes it's things that we really don't even recognize. Like we may have just fertilized our yard or used some sort of pesticide that's washed into the water system and has now become a really big problem for these animals drinking water being contaminated. When the animals come into us, the first thing that we need to do is we need to make sure to stabilize them. They've been in a very stressful situation, regardless of whatever their injury is, just being around people can often be enough to really harm their health. So they come in, the goal is to take care of their stress and any kind of pain while they can be evaluated. And then we do diagnostics, so we can do x-rays, we can take blood work, we can look at fecal samples or stool samples, if you will, to check for parasites. Once we can determine if that animal is going to be able to go back into the wild, we begin our rehab process. And that could be anything from, you know, an animal with a broken wing, having to have it cast, to surgery on some of these animals, or maybe they're just orphans like these squirrels, and we just need to raise them up and get them back out in the wild again. We do have a small group of animals that just wouldn't survive back in the wild. Um, maybe they have an old injury, like an old broken wing that's already begun to heal improperly. If that bird is a candidate for staying in a captive situation, we can work on that and we can see if that animal would be good as an educational ambassador. And that's like a lot of the animals that we have here at the sanctuary where people can come, they can view them, they can have interactions with them even. And the goal is for that animal to be an ambassador for its species and to teach people how to coexist with wildlife. These animals that you currently see behind me are all ones that will be going back out in the wild. So pretty soon, they'll make their way out into an outdoor rehab enclosure. And when they truly are healed and they don't like people, big thing there, they can't like us anymore, then we can let them go back out and wish them well on their journey. So I'd like to introduce you to Stewie. He has become the unofficial mascot of Bush Wildlife Sanctuary. Not because staff or volunteers have decided that, but truthfully the public. He is a favorite of all of us. Stewie is a black belly whistling duck, which a lot of people have never even heard of them before. Uh, black belly whistling ducks, generally you're going to see in very large groups, even groups of up to a thousand ducks together at one time. And they are somewhat seasonal here in Florida. They're going to eat mostly plants. Uh, lots of duckweed and algaes and getting into the grasses and finding little seeds and things. But they will eat some meat also, little snails and little mosquito fish and things like that. They can find them. Stewie came in to us because someone found an orphan baby black-bellied whistling duck. And they held on to him for a little while by himself. By the time he brought him to us, we would consider him to be a teenager. <laughs> so he was a juvenile and he was very used to being around people. Our main goal is to get the animals rehabilitated and back into the wild. So for Stewie, it wasn't an injury as much as teaching him that he was a wild animal. We paired him up with some other ducks and pretty quickly he started hanging out with them and we thought he'd really do well out in the wild. Took him out to a nice secluded pond, put him out there, and he hung out for a little while with some of the other ducks. Eventually one day, Stewie had left, which is perfect. We assumed that a group of whistling ducks came by he paired off with them, and off he went to enjoy his wild freedom. Unfortunately, though, Stewie had a different idea, and about a week later, he turned up at a garage sale. One of the patrons of the garage sale actually ended up taking him home. No, 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 that is illegal. You can't have a whistling duck as a pet, but he escaped there also, and he showed up at a church parking lot. Luckily, we were called to the scene at that point, and we brought Stewie back here, recognizing that he had a nice adventure, but he really wasn't set out for life in the wild. You'll notice this is not your average gray fox. Her name is DM. 
She actually came in to us when she could fit in my hands. She was a tiny little baby who unfortunately had a severely broken back leg. The growth plate of the leg was actually damaged. So even though we were able to get her back to being able to walk, her one leg is shorter by about an inch than the other leg. Gray foxes are notorious for climbing trees. So this type of disability would really hinder her out in the wild again. Gray foxes are the most common fox we have here in Florida. They are native and you'll find them in pretty much every neighborhood. They're very opportunistic. So if you leave your garbage cans unattended, there's a good chance that a gray fox will take advantage of that situation. They'll eat pretty much anything. So fruits, vegetables, meat, seeds, you name it. If it tastes yummy, a fox is going to be attracted to it. So as I mentioned, gray foxes are great climbers. Even though they're part of the canine family, they can climb very similar to a cat. Some people think they might make a good pet, but I can assure you if your dog could climb to the top of your kitchen cabinets, you wouldn't be thinking that any longer. And that's how we do end up with some of the foxes here at the sanctuary. So the second type of fox that we have in Florida is a red fox. And it's funny because when you think about red fox, you might think about the gray foxes. They do have some red in their coat. However, there's one distinct way to tell the two apart. Gray foxes always have a black tip on their tail and red foxes always have a white tip. Even if the fox itself is not red in color, if it has that white tip on its tail, it's considered a red fox. So for instance, we have a fox here that's a red fox, but her color is actually silver and black. So still the same species, but comes in a different color pattern. The red foxes were not naturally occurring here in the United States. They were brought in by the English for fox hunts, and a population boom from those who evaded escape, and also from people getting them as pets and then illegally turning them loose or escaping their owners there. They are similar to the gray foxes and what they eat and the fact that they generally come out at dawn and dusk, but they cannot climb trees like the gray foxes can. By this time, you may be wondering, how can I get into a field like this? After all, working with such wonderful animals seems like a great way to spend the day, right? So when I was little, I knew I wanted to work with animals. But really the only thing I knew about was becoming a veterinarian. And I was very, very lucky because we had a family friend who was a veterinarian who let me come and volunteer. So to spend my time there and learn about them. And what I realized very quickly was, I really did not want to be a veterinarian. <laughs> Just like you might not have the uh, enjoyable pleasure of liking going to the doctor, a lot of times animals aren't really keen about going to the veterinarian either. And I realized that I didn't want to be the doctor, I wanted to be someone that the animals really enjoyed seeing and got excited for. And that led me into becoming a veterinary technician. So kind of like a nurse. We calm the animals and we are there to support the doctor and what they need, but the animals tend to like us more because we spend a little bit more time with them and we really do make them feel better. With that though, became my love for wildlife. And that is where I started volunteering at wildlife hospitals. Because honestly, how many people on this planet right now can say they're holding a possum on their lap? That's pretty darn cool and it doesn't happen very often. With a career, whether it be in wildlife or with other animals, I definitely recommend volunteering going out there and really finding out what your true passion is. Do you like being the doctor that fixes them? Do you like being the nurse that makes them feel better? Maybe you want to be a keeper and you want to make sure that every day of their life they have proper food and clean water and fun things to play with. You might want to be a rescuer or even work behind the scenes, someone who is in marketing or fundraising to help these animals out. There's many different aspects. So I would Definitely advocate getting out there and learning about all the opportunities, visiting nature centers, visiting zoological societies, visiting sanctuaries, and then pair that with school. There is a lot that goes into knowing how to care for these animals properly, and each one of those does require education. So this is Allison, and she's one of our hospital techs here. And we've got Felipe out, which is one of our little armadillos. Uh, this little guy was actually hit by a bicycle, believe it or not. And um, we're just giving him a little once over. He had some head trauma, so we're trying to take a look at his eyes, but he's not being terribly cooperative right now. He kind of is just like, no, I want to go back to sleep. And we are in our surgical suite. So here at the sanctuary, we actually have a, a fully functioning hospital. 
Um, unfortunately, though, we do not have the ability to have a full-time veterinary staff on site. So we've got wildlife rehabilitators who work here. Um, and if we need to consult with a veterinarian, we can use the power of technology to either email or send videos or even Skype with them. Or if we need to, we can run the animals down the street and have them looked out by our vets. This is Charlie, he is our river otter. And here in Florida, these guys are again, pretty much everywhere, but they're very elusive. So you don't see them very often. They love to swim. And the really, really cool thing about them is they have this really interesting oily fur, which allows them to swim all year round. So even when it's our winter and it gets down 40, 50 degrees, the otters can still go swimming. And that oil on their fur will keep the water from actually getting down to their skin. So therefore, when they get out, it kind of just rolls right off of them and off they go on their merry little journey. They are gonna eat all different sorts of mostly animal material. So snakes and fish and turtles and lizards and bugs, uh, crabs. They can even catch birds. They're very, very resourceful. They do eat a small amount of plant material as well, which helps with their digestive system. Charlie actually lives with us because he is blind in one eye. And he was found as a young baby all by himself. For otters, that's not very unique really because mama otter is going to have to eat a lot of food in order to produce enough milk to feed her young so they'll leave otters alone for extended periods of time even eight to ten hours a day while they go out and go hunting for charlie's sake though someone had actually seen him and they waited a full 24 hours and we really felt that mom had truly either abandoned him or something had happened to her when he was brought in and it was recognized that his one eye was not functioning, we do believe that mom may have actually abandoned him because she could sense that there was something wrong with Charlie. Here in South Florida, you can't do a show about native animals without mentioning the alligator. Do you know all you should about living near this large reptile? So you'll notice I'm holding a little young alligator. This little guy here, we call him Noodle. And he got that name because of pool noodles. He was found in the skimmer of someone's swimming pool. Here's the thing. With that, if he had just been found in the pool, easy fix. Get him out, let him go. Unfortunately, these people thought they would help him out and give him a meal. Here in Florida, if an alligator, or a crocodile for that matter, is fed by a human just one time, it is never allowed to go back out into the wild again. The reason? They're pretty darn smart. If they know that a human will give them food, they're much more likely to continue going up to humans. Not only could that be unsafe for them, it could also be unsafe for us. And that is why that law is put into place. Florida is really a very cool state because we are the only state out of all 50 of the United States of America where you will find American alligators and American crocodiles. They're pretty easy to tell apart though. Gators, there's way more of them. So we're gonna kind of focus a little more heavily on these guys because you're more likely to see them on your adventures. Alligators have this wide, rounded snout. Crocodiles, theirs is more long and thin and pointed, more like a triangle. If you look at his mouth, you'll see that alligators kind of look like they're smiling at you. When their mouth closes, their top row of teeth is always exposed. With crocodiles, when they close their mouth, you're gonna see all their teeth, top and bottom. They look more like they're growling than smiling. And in my experience, crocodiles are usually way more aggressive than alligators. Another thing to notice is their color. So this is a young gator. He's this dark, almost all black color, and he has these very little yellow lines. Those are his camouflage. It helps him blend in in our fresh waters. As he gets older, these yellow lines are gonna fade away. He really doesn't need to blend in anymore, and he's gonna turn all this darker shade that you see. Crocodiles, they're gonna maintain the same color their entire life, and it's more like an olive green with little faint black stripes. Now you might wonder why they're different colors. Well, it goes back to their camouflage. Alligators are in fresh water, so lakes and ponds and canals and streams. They can go all the way up into the Carolinas or as far west as Texas. Crocodiles, though, hang out in brackish water. Brackish is a mixture of fresh water and salt water, so kind of like where a canal meets the ocean. They'll hang out there because the alligators won't come into that territory. They don't have to fight with them over what is their property. 
and they are that color because that helps them blend in in their environment. If you see an alligator or a crocodile, leave it alone. They really don't want to do much of anything. In case you haven't noticed, Noodle's pretty lazy, doesn't move much, and that's typical of all of these reptiles because a lot of times they don't know where their next meal is coming from and they want to conserve their energy. If for some reason something has happened and you've upset the animal or maybe you've gotten too close to its nest, the old wise tale is to run zigzags to get away. It's just that, a myth. If for any reason you are being chased by one of these animals, run as fast as you can in a straight line or get up high. Once you get above their line of vision, they don't really even know you exist anymore. So this particular x-ray was actually of a crocodile that swallowed a fishing hook. And the funny thing was, is this was found on the west coast of Florida in an area where crocodiles are normally not found. So this particular trapper went out thinking he was gonna remove a nuisance alligator from a development. It turned out being a crocodile, which is of course an endangered species here in Florida. So the crocodile was brought over to us and we actually had to sedate the animal and remove the hook. Thankfully, the animal was fine. There wasn't any internal damage and we were able to return him back in an area that was more appropriate, back down at Turkey Point, down by the Florida Keys. So one of the great things about having our own wildlife hospital with digital x-ray available to us is in many situations, not only are we able to expedite or hurry up the care for the animals, but we can actually help when it comes to a legal case. So this one was actually a squirrel that someone had shot with a BB gun. That is illegal. Believe it or not, even though the BB, which is right here, right at his eye socket, um, was able to be removed. So we were able to remove the BB, rehabilitate the squirrel, and then the BB itself and this x-ray was able to be used as evidence in a court case for that person to be charged with animal cruelty. We actually got a conviction on this one and the squirrel was released back out into the world. So it was really a win-win at the end of the day. I just think this is really a neat x-ray uh, for the plain fact that so many people don't even believe me when I tell them snakes have bones. <laughs> but this is actually the rib cage and the, and the spinal cord of an Everglades rat snake, also known as a yellow rat snake. And what's really interesting is, let's see if I can zoom in here for you, all of these little circles in here are actually eggs. So this is what we call a gravid snake. So this one came into us and we were able to treat it. I believe if I remember correctly, it had an upper respiratory infection. Um, we were able to treat the animal and yet the eggs were still viable and they were laid and hatched and we were able to reintroduce a whole bunch of Everglades rat snakes back out into our world. So I've got my friend here. This is a red rat snake. These guys come in all kinds of colors. You can have red ones, gray ones, yellow ones. In the pet trade, they're even pink and purple. They have a nickname. Their nickname is corn snake, and you can see on the belly here. They've got this beautiful corn-like pattern, kind of like the Indian corn you see around Thanksgiving, and that's where they get that name from. They also like to hang out in corn fields, if we had any here in Florida, uh, because their favorite thing to eat is rats. Hence their other name, rat snake. They will eat mice and bugs and other little um, lizards, even potentially other snakes. So they're very, very valuable to our environment. Obviously, this guy is non-venomous. This snake is completely harmless, wonderful to have in our neighborhoods. A lot of people often see this red and black and yellow and they think, uh-oh, I know there's a venomous snake like that. And that would be the coral snake. It's really relatively rare to come across a venomous snake. There's over 50 different kinds of snakes that live here in Florida, and only seven of those are venomous. Best thing though, if you come across a snake, leave it alone, especially if you don't know what it is. Better to be safe than sorry. Most of our venomous snakes that you're gonna find in Florida, they don't wanna blend in. They really wanna stand out. Think about your rattlesnakes. Rattlesnakes have that rattle on the end of their tail to get your attention. It lets you know, hey, I'm here. Don't mess with me. The coral snake, very distinct red and black and yellow bands going around them. Again, they don't have camouflage. They don't want to blend in. They want you to see them and they want you to leave them alone. Any snake you find, best to just back up and walk away. Snakes do not have a way of reversing, so you kind of have to do it for them. Quite often, you'll hear people say, oh, it's a poisonous snake. Yeah, not quite right. The proper term is venomous. The reason for that is poison is something you ingest. 
So you could actually, like the bufo frogs, they have a poison that's emitted from their skin and then you would ingest that, like our dogs sometimes if they go after them. When it comes to a snake, it's not their skin, it wouldn't be us biting them, it would actually be them biting you. Venom has to be injected. And for the venomous snakes, of course, they use their teeth to inject that venom into you. Here in Florida, we do have some non-native species also. You'll hear people talk about the pythons down in the Everglades or finding a boa constrictor. Those guys are not supposed to live here in Florida. They're from other countries, but due to pets either being released or escaping, we do have some that live in our environment. They do a lot of damage because they're much larger than our little corn snakes and other native species that we have here. So it is best to get them out of our environment and place them in proper facilities like a sanctuary or a zoo. So there's a few really unique physical features of a snake. First, they don't have any arms or legs, <laughs> as you know. So they use these awesome scales on their belly. And these scales go against their horizontally, and that is what helps them move across the ground. For something like a corn snake, they actually have special scales that allow them to live up in trees. So they can climb straight up a wall or straight up the side of a tree using those scales. You'll also notice another thing that's missing, ears. Snakes don't have any ears. All this great stuff we're saying about them, they can't hear a single word of it. Instead, they sense vibration, which is movement. So if you're walking through the woods, you are actually creating the ground to shake ever so slightly, but it's enough for the snakes to feel it. They can tell the difference between a human or even something yummy, like a little rat that might be running around. And they'll know which way to go to either find food or avoid danger. And that's because of their really cool tongue. Now you'll notice he'll stick his tongue in and out at us. He's not being rude. Instead, it's actually the way he smells. They've got this really cool forked tongue. And so they can stick it out into the world, wiggle it around, and they'll pick up all the things in the air that we smell with our nose. It'll stick to their tongue, they'll bring it in, touch it to the roof of their mouth, and that's how they smell. It's a really cool thing called a Jacobson organ. Now, the reason it's forked, it's their own little built-in GPS system. They can actually tell by where the particles land on their tongue, which direction to go. So if they smell a rat to the right and a human to the left, they'll know which way to go to either find food or to avoid danger. Here in Florida, you'll find plenty of snakes living pretty much everywhere. We do have water snakes. They're usually very aggressive because when they're little, they look like worms. Y'all know what fish like to eat, right? Worms. So the snakes have to really protect themselves. We'll have some of them that can climb trees, like the rat snake here. They're pretty much all around. Coral snakes, they like to kind of burrow, so they'll get underneath stuff. So if you're ever out gardening, I always recommend take a broom or a rake, just kind of wiggle things around. Let any snakes that might be hiding know you're there so that you don't encounter them later as you're trying to plant some beautiful flowers. This is a box turtle. Box turtles get their name because they can actually hinge their shell to close themselves up, kind of like closing up a box. So they can suck their front legs, their head, their back legs, and everything inside in case a predator was to approach it. Not sure if this little one will kind of let me show you here, but you can actually see where the hinge is located there, which will help them. Of course, he's not gonna do it at this point. Um, but the way they close themselves in to avoid predators. They are a land turtle. These guys don't do well in water. If you were to actually submerge them completely in water, they unfortunately wouldn't make it. Uh, they can't go in water because they can absorb water through their skin like all reptiles can. Um, but other than that, you're gonna find them on land. And they've got these neat little legs look kind of like elephant legs almost, and that's what tells you that this type of animal really doesn't belong in the water. This is a gopher tortoise. So they are a larger type of land turtle or tortoise that we have here in Florida. These are different from the box turtle because they do not have a hinge shell. Instead, what they'll do if they want to avoid someone is they'll pull their head in and then they'll take their feet and kind of block their face off with it and kind of avoid any predators that way. Gopher tortoises are of major value to other animals. They dig these very long burrows, and when I say very long, I mean the length of a football field. They're underground, and they're basically little apartment buildings. 
For that reason, gopher tortoises are called a keystone species. Other animals rely on those apartment building like burrows to survive. You'll find different kinds of snakes living down there, different kinds of mice, rats, even burrowing owls will share the space. These guys are of major importance with those apartment like burrows when a fire were to break out in the woods. So let's say maybe lightning struck a tree and a forest fire broke out. For the animals that aren't fast enough to get out of the line, what they'll do is actually go down in those burrows. And it's a safe haven. They've actually put cameras on those burrows after a wildfire and they've seen rabbits, foxes, raccoons, even coyotes emerge from those burrows where they've waited out in safety. So this is an African spur-thighed tortoise, also known as a sulcata. And as you can see by their name, African, these are not native to Florida. They do not belong here. But if you notice the sheer size of this animal, a tortoise that can be 80 to 100 pounds, they're much larger than our native species. And therefore, when they're being kept as a pet, pet owners need to understand how long they're gonna live and how big they're gonna get. When they're released or they escape back out into our environment here in Florida, they do a ton of damage. They eat so much more than our native species. And quite honestly, due to their size, they can be bullies. And that becomes a real problem for our poor little gopher tortoises and box turtles that are already struggling to survive. Of course, that big tortoise is not native to South Florida. Even so, it is one of the many animals that now lives here. One native creature that you may encounter at any time of the day or night is the raccoon. Interestingly enough, we've got some animals that people aren't terribly fond of, and we kind of refer to them lovingly as the garbage gang. And probably the leader, if you will, of the garbage gang is really the raccoons. Raccoons are found everywhere. They are extremely common, but a lot of people get kind of freaked out by them. A lot of people, too, get really worried if they see them out during the day and they think something's wrong. But that's actually a total myth. Raccoons generally come out during the daytime for one of two reasons. One, this is pretty smart, mama raccoons only come out during the day. That's so they can find enough food to get home, take care of their babies, and protect them from other raccoons overnight. That leads me to number two. The reason why you're gonna see raccoons out is people. People often tend to leave things unattended, such as their garbage cans, putting cat food out for a neighborhood animal, bird feeders, all of these things actually attract animals to your yard. Raccoons are very, very smart. They know this. So not only are they gonna take advantage of those opportunities, but they're gonna make some of their own. If you've got fruit trees in the area, they're more than happy to clean up any of the fruit that started to fall and rot. They're happy to take care of your bug population. And they love to eat lizards too. So the raccoons are actually very beneficial. They kind of work like a outdoor vacuum cleaner, if you will. A lot of myths when it comes to raccoons and rabies. Of course, rabies is a disease that's considered a zoonotic disease, meaning that people can actually contract the virus from animals. So I can understand why there's a lot of worry when it comes to this. However, there's very distinct things that you need to know about the animals and about rabies, not only to protect yourself, but also to just keep an eye on the environment around you. So raccoons, foxes, bats, and skunks are the animals that actively carry the rabies virus here in Florida. Those are the ones to be most concerned with. If you see an animal out during the day, does not mean it has rabies. Um, if you see the animal and it doesn't appear to be scared of you, doesn't always mean rabies. Some of these animals are, are kind of like possums <laughs> where when they see something scary, they just freeze. And they hope that that means that nothing's going to bother them. What you do need to look out for if you see an animal acting strange and you're concerned that it might be sick is one of two things, because there's two stages of rabies. The first stage is furious rabies. And this is where the animal is really starting to get so sick that it doesn't necessarily know what it's doing. They become extremely aggressive. And when I say extremely, I mean they will run after cars. They will start chewing on their, their own feet even, or their own tail. They really don't have any sense of what's, what's right and wrong and what's scary in the world. And they become just extremely aggressive at this point. That's for the last seven days, if you will, before they become what's called dumb rabid. 
Dumb rabies is the exact opposite of furious rabies. So once an animal goes through that furious stage, now all of a sudden they become extremely sweet and they start actually walking up to people's personal pets. Um, I went on a case one time where there was a, a big, gorgeous, sweet Rottweiler in the yard and the raccoon was actually petting the animal. He'd really kind of lost what was right and wrong in the world. So if you see an animal that's behaving that way, or that extreme aggression, you definitely want to let someone know. And you can contact us here at Bush Wildlife and we'll be happy to try to talk you through and, and ask you a few questions to figure out the situation. So you might notice with raccoons, they have a lot of physical adaptations or things that make them really much better at surviving in our environment. You'll notice their front feet, which are almost like hands. They do have these opposable thumbs and they're quite good at manipulating things. They can take lids off of garbage cans. They can open up coolers. One of the things that I think is really interesting is raccoons, they will actually take their food and wash it before they eat it. So you'll often find them getting into swimming pools or bird baths or fountains, and they'll wash all their food off and clean it really, really well before they eat. And then the funny thing is, oftentimes they'll turn around and use that same area as a bathroom when they're done because they like to be really, really clean. If you have an animal doing this in your area that's causing a little bit of havoc, maybe he's pooping in your pool, something like that, they don't go in where they have to submerge themselves. They just stand on the step. So if you just block off the step with a little bit of plywood, they're gonna move on over to your neighbor's house, then you can ask them for five bucks to tell them the secret of how you gotta leave your place. So this is Pretty Boy, and he is a striped skunk. You can see <laughs> he's got this beautiful stripe that runs down his face, and then he's got stripes that go down his back. He's one of two kinds of skunks that we actually share Florida with. Striped skunks are living in the wooded areas. Spotted skunks, they hang out at the beach. They're quite a bit smaller. They've got little spots, hence spotted skunk, and they prefer more sandy, duny kinds of areas. And we all know what skunks can do, right? When they get upset, they spray you. But what a lot of people don't know is that's not their first line of defense. They don't want to spray you. It's kind of their last ditch effort to get you to leave them alone or to get predators to leave them alone, an animal which might try to harm them. First thing, again, take a look. There is no camouflage on these guys. They are not meant to blend in. They're meant to stand out. That should tell you in nature that if something's very brightly colored and does not camouflage in their environment, you should leave them alone. If that's not enough, they will take these feet and they will stomp them at you. They're trying to get your attention. They're trying to make vibration. They're letting you know they're there. If that's still not good enough, this big fluffy tail comes up and they wag it at you. Three strikes, you're out. <laughs> you are gonna get sprayed at that point. Little spotted skunks, they're not even that nice. They throw their front feet down, kick their back feet up into a handstand, drop their tail, and they spray you doing gymnastics. It's crazy. Here's a couple of things about the skunk spray you need to be aware of. It's never ending. Once they start spraying, they can continuously make more. They can spray it in a straight line and aim right for one person, or let's say a few dogs were coming after them. They can diffuse it like in a big cloud and hit all of them at the same time. Skunk spray can reach almost 20 feet away. That's quite a distance. You really want to give these guys plenty of respect. You'll see Pretty Boy has these long nails. They're not really sharp, but they're used for digging. Out in the wild, they are gonna dig in the ground, looking for bugs. They're gonna dig in tree bark, looking for termites. They're just trying to uncover any kind of yummy thing they can find. They will eat fruits, vegetables, and meat, so they are an omnivore. And they are nocturnal, meaning they generally come out at night. The way we get a lot of our striped skunks here at Bush Wildlife Sanctuary is because people try to keep them as pets. Not a great idea. If you think about what I just told you, they're up all night long. They like to destroy things with their claws. You really can't litter box train them. These guys, not a very good idea for a pet. You're gonna wanna stick with your usual dogs, cats, rabbits, fun things like that. So this is Fern. She is one of our Virginia opossums. Right off the bat, people have a reaction to opossums. Either they love them, they're kind of freaked out by them. And personally, I love them. Possums are the only marsupial we have in North America. Marsupial, of course, being an animal that has a pouch where they keep their babies. So 
Pretty awesome. Australia, New Zealand, they have a ton. North America, just one, the Virginia opossum. Couple other cool things, possums, they do not carry rabies. A lot of people get really freaked out if they see a possum out, they automatically think, oh, he's not acting quite right. Well, guess what? Possums never act quite right. <laughs> they tend to be kind of drooly, they tend to be a little stinky, and their eyesight is very poor, so they always look somewhat disoriented. Their sense of smell is amazing. That's why they've got this long nose and all these whiskers. So they're generally trying to figure out their environment based on their sense of smell and their hearing, which is why they have these big ears also. It might make them look though a little bit like they don't know what's going on. Possums are only pregnant for 10 days. That's right, 10 days. And when the babies are born, mom can have up to 25 kids at one time, and they're about the size of your pinky fingernail. All those babies could fit on a teaspoon the day they're born. Once they are uh, out in the world, they're gonna make their way into mom's pouch. Mom can't fit all the babies in there, so unfortunately it's kinda tough love from the beginning. Once the babies are in the pouch though, they're gonna stay there for four months. They're gonna nurse constantly, and at four months old, they'll be four inches long, about the size of the palm of your hand. At this point, it's getting pretty crowded in that pouch. They're gonna start climbing out, and they're gonna hold on to mom's fur. They've got thumbs on all four of their feet to hold on really, really well. <laughs> Once they come out of mom's pouch, they hold on, and mom takes them out in the world and teaches them how to be possums. She's gonna teach them who their friends are, who their enemies are, what to eat, and what to avoid. This goes on for about one month. At five months old, the babies start letting go, they just happen to slide off mom's back, and that's the end of possum parenting. She keeps going on her way, knowing she's done the best she can for them. Possums also have a really cool way of protecting themselves, similar to the skunk we talked about. They don't run, they don't hide, they play dead. Now this is actually a chemical reaction that takes place in their brain. It's kind of like you or I if we were to faint. We don't have any control over it, and neither do opossums. If something is coming towards them that's scary, their immediate reaction is to open their mouth and show all their teeth. They have the most teeth of any land mammal in North America, okay? Only animal lives in the water, and that's the dolphin. They show off those teeth. If that works, great. If not, and the fear is still continuing to rush through their body, there's a chemical that's released that causes them to pass out. They go totally stiff, they fall over, they even let out a nasty smell that smells like they died a few days ago. If it's a wild animal, they're not gonna want anything to do with that possum. They're gonna think, something's wrong here. The animal was alive a second ago, and now it's laying there and it smells bad. I'm not gonna go near it because I don't want whatever it has. The only time where this really doesn't work for the possum is people. Think about this. If someone is driving down the road and a possum is crossing, the possum sees the front headlights of that car, they're gonna think it's an animal coming at them. They open their mouth, nothing happens. The next thing, their body kicks in and they pass out. And this is how most possums get injured, is they play dead in front of oncoming traffic. If that's a mama possum and she were to get hit, she could have all those babies in her pouch that also need help. We get over 400 baby opossums in Bush Wildlife Sanctuary every year due to car collisions. So possums are omnivores. They eat really pretty much anything. I kind of call them an outdoor garbage disposal. They'll eat fruits, fruits that have fallen from trees that are starting to rot. They'll eat all kinds of bugs. Possums are notorious for eating all the ticks in our environment that obviously can carry diseases for our pets or for humans. So having these guys around is extremely beneficial. Again, I said they don't carry rabies, they're gonna take care of your ticks, they're gonna eat any decaying matter that's around, take care of your bug population. How couldn't you love a possum? Information like that just might change your opinion of the opossum. Another native animal that is sometimes misunderstood, the black bear, which is more prevalent in the central and northern part of the state. Kiona here is actually showing off some of her skills that she's been trained to do. And this might not look up like much of anything to you, but this is part of her medical behaviors. We need her to be able to stand up like this so that we can take a look at the bottom of her feet, make sure if she's limping for any reason, that we don't have any cuts, bug bites. <laughs> 
She actually is a very gentle animal. Of course, out in the wild, you should never feed a bear of any sort. She is actually a, a Florida black bear. Uh, these are rather common, if you will, in places like Everglades National Park and the Ocala National Forest. But here in a very urban area like Palm Beach County, you really shouldn't come across one of these animals. They are technically pretty darn lazy. I've noticed with our bears here, their main goal in life is just to find enough food to take care of themselves and then to rest the rest of the time. In Florida, they don't really hibernate because there's no need to. We don't get those extreme cold temperatures, but they do go into a state where they become a little quieter and they do put a little bit more weight because they recognize that not as much vegetation is blooming and finding food might not be quite as easy or plentiful as it is during the summertime. The two bears we have here are sisters, Kiona and her sister Taya, who's out enjoying the yard right now. And these guys are both here because unfortunately, they had been taught some nasty little habits. Their mom had taught them that when they got hungry to find a garbage can or a campground. They also learned to get into swimming pools. And therefore, the state of Florida was concerned about safety. Not just the safety of people who might approach them, but also the safety of the bears. If someone was scared of them, they might take, um, you know, and harm them, something like that. So therefore, uh, it was determined that the bears needed to be brought into a captive situation. You're coming closer, am I not going fast enough? <laughs> it was determined that the bears needed to be kept in a captive situation. So they've been at the sanctuary here for over a decade. Makaya here is one of two large cats that live at Bush Wildlife Sanctuary. And when I say large cats, what I'm referring to is an animal which we would call a Florida panther. However, Florida panthers, Texas cougars, the California mountain lion, pumas, they're all basically the exact same cat. It's just where you find them geographically determines what you would call them. So most likely Makaya is more along the genetic lines of a cougar. And the reason I say that is because cougars have historically been bred in captive situations. And this particular cat came in with her brother over a decade ago when they were trying to be illegally smuggled into Florida by way of Palm Beach International Airport. Uh, they had been used in an Ohio shopping mall where you could pay like $10 and have your picture taken with a wild animal. And when they got too big, they tried to sell them here into Florida. They were confiscated at the airport and Bush Wildlife Sanctuary took possession of them. In the wild, there's estimated to be only about 100 to 150 Florida panthers left. And the reason for that is not because we've run out of a food source for them or anything like that. It's really that we have taken up all of their habitat. One cat wants many, many acres to live out in the wild. And we really have developed Florida to the point where that's just not a reality any longer. Their favorite food in the wild would be something like a deer or a pig. They tend to eat larger things just because of their sheer size. Catching a small rabbit or a squirrel would be almost like a french fry for these massive cats. Far smaller and more common are bobcats, which tend to be rather shy creatures. This morning, we are in Bush Wildlife Sanctuary's bobcat enclosure. And you'll notice behind me that there are two of our resident bobcats. This is Porter and Paisley. As you can see, even though I've known them their entire life almost, they still are a little bit nervous because we've got the camera in here and we've got some other people around. This is typically how bobcats are going to act in the wild. They don't want anything to do with things that are unfamiliar to them. I usually tell people, think about your own home. If you have a pet cat and a stranger comes over, what happens with your cat? Majority of cats, even domestic cats, will go run and hide. Same thing when you're talking about bobcats. Just like these guys did, they just ran back to their little safe night house because it's probably a little off-putting that we've got all this going on here this morning. Bobcats in the wild are going to behave the same way. If they've got an exit route, they'll go where they feel safe. Few neat things to know about bobcats. They get their name from their tail. If you ever think about this, you know, ladies have a, a nice short haircut. It's called a bob haircut. Bobs get their name from their bob tail. It's a short tail. It's not cut, but it naturally is just a very short little tail. <laughs> they also have these really cool things on the back of their ears called false eye spots. And basically, they're these white spots that are made to look like eyes in the back of their head. 
If you think about it, you ever hear anyone say, I got eyes in the back of my head, I can see what you're doing. That's actually what the bobcat is trying to make you think. They will lay very, very still <laughs> underneath some tall grasses and those white spots will look kind of like eyes. What the bobcat is hoping is that anything that might be in their food chain, something like a squirrel or a bunny or a rat, is actually gonna believe that those eye spots are the eyes and that the bobcat's looking the wrong direction. Therefore, they'll run right in front of the bobcat and they have an opportunity to pounce on them. Bobcats are all over Florida. They are very, very common. You're probably just not aware of it though for the plain fact that they hide so much. If you see a bobcat in the wild, just leave them alone. No need to mess with them. No need to be alarmed. Just respect them and they'll do the same for you. This mission began in 1983, just basically with our founding director who loved reptiles. He was kind of the guy who would take out snakes to show the neighborhood kids, and people would contact him if they had questions, just from his passion with animals. That grew into a full-fledged wildlife hospital. In 1992, Hurricane Andrew affected Miami, where he was located, and we moved the sanctuary up to the Jupiter area. In 1997, we partnered with the Loxhatchee River Environmental Control District to lease this piece of property that we exist on now. We hope that you can come visit us. We are open six days a week from 10 to 4.30, and we have 24-hour on-call service if you are to encounter an animal in need. Please call us at 561-575-3399 should you have any questions about the sanctuary, helping animals, or if you found one that needs immediate assistance. Bush Wildlife offers all sorts of programs to educate people of all ages about nature, wildlife, and the issues that affect our environment. We hope that by sharing a bit about each of these animals, you have grown in your understanding and respect for these living creatures and their habitats.